Hi, uh, this is Aykut Udana. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our ECR uh, plasma etching machine here at uh, CIS at Stanford University. Uh, this machine, uh, which we call Plasma Quest, is intended for uh, primarily for gallium arsenide uh, etching and uh, for other 3,5 compounds. And uh, basically, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the operation of the machine, the structure of the machine, and uh, what we use, what people use it for, and uh, show step by step uh, how you can put your sample in, how you can edit your recipe, uh, how you can set your uh, etching or deposition temperature, and uh, how uh, you can finish up. Please. Okay, uh, so Plasma Quest is an uh, ECR etcher machine, and uh, this is basically ECR stands for electron cyclotron resonance. And uh, the way this machine operates is uh, we load a wafer into the etching chamber here uh, in this black uh, cylinder, and uh, the gases uh, that make the plasma are injected through uh, controlled valves, controlled pipes, and uh, we have this permanent magnet here on the top which supplies a magnetic field in this direction, in the uh, vertical direction. And uh, in a magnetic field, as you know, the uh, free charges tend to circle. And uh, by a simple calculation, it turns out that uh, in a constant magnetic field, the op uh, rotation period of the charged particle is independent of its energy. So basically, uh, <laughs> once the magnetic field is set for a particle of some certain mass, it always rotate in the same uh, peri period. And uh, basically, this period is about, I think, 2.4 gigahertz uh, for uh, this magnetic field in this machine. And uh, this resonance, this rotation, this resonance, allows a very efficient pumping of microwave power uh, to make a very uh, dense and efficient uh, plasma. Uh, which supplies the ions required for etching gallium arsenide and other uh, compounds. So basically, the chamber, as you can see, has this uh, microwave guide. It's a wave guide uh, which connects to a microwave source uh, through this wave guide. Uh, we inject microwave power into uh, the chamber from the top and we accelerate the ions and uh, break the gases and form the plasma. So uh, these tuning stops here, because the plasma impedance, electrical impedance depends on uh, its density, its uh, composition, uh, we may need to tune uh, for efficient power transfer, we may need to tune the microwave uh, injection using uh, these tuning stops. Uh, we also have a circulator here, which it's a three-port microwave device. You can see. Uh, basically, what this device does is when we inject from one port the microwave, uh, the, the waves go in this direction, and whatever power is detected back comes back and uh, doesn't go back to the generator, but goes to this cooled detector here. So we know what uh, efficiency we are injecting the microwave power into the plasma. So here on the top we have two dials, which is reflected and forward, which show the two powers uh, of the injected or forward microwave power and the reflected power. <laughs> For efficient uh, plasma, we generally want uh, the forward power to be uh, very close to the setting that we set through the computer, and we want the reflected power to be a minimum. So during operation, we use the tuning stops here uh, to minimize the reflective power, which we can get down to about maybe a few percent, and that would be good enough. So uh, the way the machine works is basically <laughs> once the wafer is load, loaded in uh, to the chamber, uh, the machine starts to uh, send in gases. Uh, that, that would make up the plasma. And we also have a set point uh, of pressure depending on our uh, etching recipe. And here we can see a turbo pump 
which is always pumping on the chamber, and the computer control valve. And uh, the computer, by using feedback control, uh, sets the pressure of the chamber according to the recipe. <laughs> and uh, basically, after that, the microwave comes on, and you can start etching. So the way the uh, machine is made is uh, the wafer is isolated electrically from the rest of the machine because uh, the plasma itself is floating, but uh, we have to bias the plasma with respect to the wafer to be able to accelerate the ions in the plasma and achieve some anisotropic etching maybe. Uh, so the way the wafer is held is on ceramic pins and on an isolated uh, chuck uh, from the rest of the machine. But we may have problems if we want to etch for a long time or we want to deposit something. Uh, we may have problems with the stability of the temperature because the wafer or the chuck sits in vacuum. So to overcome this problem, uh, the manufacturer has basically supplied an O-ring uh, with a helium gas flow on the back side of the wafer. So helium gas flows on the back side of the wafer uh, and stabilizes the temperature of the wafer during etching process or deposition process. And uh, we can basically cool uh, the helium gas uh, using this chiller. This uh, chiller, I think, has a uh, sort of like a glycol solution or uh, some, some solution which can go below zero degree Celsius and go up to maybe 120, 150 degree centigrade. Uh, and maybe if you come over here, there are the dials. Uh, so we have a temperature controller which controls the uh, uh, chuck temperature and uh, you can see the current temperature, if you don't press any buttons or anything, generally, uh, that's what you see, is uh, the current temperature of the chuck or uh, the cooling fluid. There is this button here. It says display, uh, if you look closely on it. When you press this, basically, you see the number change. And this is uh, our set point. So there's a feedback controller, basically, uh, which controls the temperature of the fluid to the set point. And we have the two dials, fine and coarse, uh, which we can, when you press the button, we can uh, change the set point. So we also have these two uh, switches, which control if the refrigerator is going to be on or uh, off or is it going to be low power or high power? Basically, this is just, uh, if you want to cool down, you have to remember to turn on the refrigerator. Generally, the set point can be set below uh, below 20 degrees or so, so that the heater won't come on and uh, that the chuck is going to stabilize at uh, the ambient temperature. Generally, this takes about uh, half an hour to one hour to stabilize. So if you want to do a temperature controlled uh, etching or deposition, you should come uh, about maybe one hour earlier and uh, set the uh, chiller and uh, it'll stabilize in about half an hour to one hour to your set point. Uh, so let me, let me also point out that uh, the water cooler or the chiller goes uh, below uh, zero degree centigrade, it can go down to minus 10 or so I guess and you can go up to 120, 130 degrees with the water cooler. We also have a resistive heater here. And you can see the dial. Uh, this is an integrated part of the uh, system and uh, this one can heat the wafer to maybe 200 degrees or so. Maybe. Uh, and this has no cooler, so you can't cool your wafer with this, but uh, you can go up to maybe higher temperatures if you want to do some deposition. Uh, maybe at 150 degrees centigrade or so. You can set your chiller to 120 or 130 and uh, get additional heating with the resistive heater. So this is a way to control the temperature of the wafer.
So uh, generally, the high temperature operation of the machine is for deposition. Uh, we can deposit maybe nitride or uh, maybe some thin film silicon with this machine, but because this machine is generally uh, or primarily intended for gallium arsenide and related compounds, uh, we don't want any deposition uh, done with this machine. Uh, and the reason is because uh, the machine has, be, has to be preconditioned before deposition and has to be cleaned after deposition. And still, uh, this, this causes some cleanliness problems and somebody has to open up the chamber every, uh, once in a while uh, to clean the remaining uh, deposited uh, material on this chamber surface. And also, uh, for high temperature operation, uh, you will have to talk to a staff member and you may have to remove the o-ring inside the chamber. So uh, this is just, just for noting uh, these points about the machine. And uh, the way we uh, generally do etching on small pieces of gallium arsenide is because the machine accepts 4-inch wafers, standard 4-inch silicon wafers, uh, like this. Uh, we have to somehow mount our small pieces of gallium arsenide onto these carrier wafers. And previously we used to use vacuum grease, uh, but because of contamination problems now, uh, we would like to only use maybe a cover or carbon, a carbon tape uh, to mount uh, the small pieces onto the 4-inch wafers, or maybe use special made wafers with some sort of rails or housing, uh, and no grease or glue or tape. Uh, so uh, in these rails, you can put your small pieces of uh, gallium arsenide, and generally they won't fall off. And uh, another solution to mount your uh, small pieces of uh, gallium arsenide onto these four-inch papers is uh, you can uh, spin a thin photoresist, and before baking, you can place your uh, gallium arsenide pieces onto the uh, photoresist, and then maybe bake it softly. Uh, so the wafers will stick and they won't fall off. And this is the way, uh, another way you can uh, mount your samples onto the carrier wafer and process them in the plasma test. And uh, basically, once you mount your uh, samples onto the 4-inch wafer, uh, we have this load lock and the load arm where you put your 4-inch uh, carrier wafer onto. And the load arm, there is, a base, uh, there is this place where you, play, uh, where you uh, at this location you place your carrier wafer and once the operation is started basically the load arm is going to if there is a wafer on the load arm it's going to load into the chamber we can also see that there is a uh, optical sensor which senses if there is a wafer or not on the load arm and this works best if the wafer is a clean silicon uh, wafer if you have some sort of coating uh, or if you are not using a standard silicon wafer, the optical sensitivity is sometimes not enough to recognize that there's a carrier wafer and the machine may hang up. So it's best to use a standard clean silicon wafer. So we also have our logbook here. So in the logbook, uh, we want all the users to put uh, their names, what recipes they ran, and the date, and also their set points and their readings. So, as you can see here, so as you can see here, uh, people will note their set points for the gases, the actual flow rates, the microwave power, the uh, and all other settings. And uh, if they have a problem or if they have some uh, calibrated result from the machine, they also would generally write in the comments box here. And uh, this is going to help uh, the staff to keep track of the problems with the machine uh, or uh, help other users to uh, repeat what other people have done so they won't have to re the machine all the time. So we want all the users to log in whatever etching or deposition or whatever uh, recipe they use, we want them, uh, to put everything here in the logbook. So I'm going to put that back. And 
Uh, maybe I can tell you about the operation of the machine. So I'm going to tell you about the control panel. Uh, first of all, we have this on button. It, it has to be lit. Uh, this light here uh, shows that the machine is uh, enabled through uh, the computer system of CIS. Unless you enable the machine, uh, if you forget and if this uh, on light is not on, the machine may seem to work, but I think the sensor here in the load lock is connected or disabled if the machine is not uh, enabled through the system. And it may seem to work and it, it may just hang up and you will not understand why it, it didn't work. Uh, so just make sure that the machine is enabled and the light is on. So basically, uh, we have a keyboard which we can use to enter our numbers. This is uh, the screen saver. When the machine is not being used, generally it's in this state. So when you come in, you, you should find uh, the machine in the state. And when you hit spacebar, the machine is going to come off uh, out of the screen saver mode. So here basically in this uh, window, in the screen, we have these large buttons down below. Uh, and the way we use uh, the machine is we have this light pen which we move over the screen and when you click when you press basically uh, the button is here so this is going to be your uh, mouse click so different operation modes uh, can be chosen by these buttons Service mode is not intended for general users. This is for uh, technical staff which, uh, which ha have to maintain the machine if something is broken or it has to be cleaned or something has to be placed. So you never use this. Edit recipe, run recipe, uh, these are uh, the two uh, m modes you will mostly use. And edit recipe can be accessed through the run window, so you don't even have to press edit you generally just press run recipe. But generally, when the machine is idle, it's left in the idle mode, where if you press, the, uh, when you come in, you should press idle, the, uh, the button idle mode, and you have this window, pop-up window, which tells you that the machine is being purged by Arden Yes, which means uh, for cleanliness of the machine, Arden Yes is continuing to run, run through the main chamber, and uh, the turbo pump is pumping down uh, to about two millitor. So, when you start uh, operating the machine, at first you have to exit the idle mode, so the purging is going to stop. So you have like a small hissing sound when you hit that button. And now the ma machine, you can go into the run mode, uh, where you, you can edit your recipes or uh, run a recipe. So it's password protected, but the password is sort of... Uh, uh, given out to all users and it's PQ for Plasma Quest it's P and uh, Q uh, and it's in uh, small letters, it's not in caps it's, uh, when you do this a schematic of the machine comes on so basically uh, on the top here it says recipe name so the, the way this machine works is we have this uh, list of operations called recipes. Each recipe is a collection of steps, and each step tells a, a sort of is like a set point for the status of the machine. So, for example, uh, if you want to do Yalimar Sanat etching, uh, anisotropic etching, you just have to load your wafer, wait it to stabilize a little bit, put, start putting in the gases, uh, like ECR3 and chlorine and then start uh, your microwave and wait for a, sh a certain amount of time for the etching to take place and then purge and clean the chamber and take it out. So all these small steps makes makes up your recipe. Uh, so, and we generally want everybody to have their own recipe under their own name 
uh, because we don't want users to uh, modify other users' recipes. And uh, the top left corner of the screen, you can see the present uh, recipe name. So on the top of the screen, we have these buttons. And close basically exits the run mode and goes back to uh, the startup screen. You can select the recipe. So if you hit that, then a pop-up window comes on. And by pressing this, we can select all these different uh, recipes. I'm just going to select train recipe for now to show you uh, how we can edit recipes. So, as you see now, uh, the recipe name has changed to train recipe. When you hit this button, which says edit recipe, it goes into the editor. So this is pretty much a blank recipe, just, just for playing around, and uh, this is the recipe I use when I uh, train people. <laughs> Here on the top, you have uh, all these buttons which help you edit these recipes or copy parts of other recipes to a new recipe. So I would recommend, uh, if you are a new user, you can make a new recipe and copy step by step uh, some other recipe or uh, from a previous user or a standard recipe uh, that's already in the machine and then edit your own recipe or modify your own recipe according to your own needs. <laughs> so the way we edit this is we have these buttons. We have 12 gases uh, which come in two groups. So the way the gases are supplied in the chamber are they are supplied uh, from close to the chuck or from a little high above. So they are called upstream and downstream gases. Uh, there is really not too much distinction about them for us right now. But <laughs> basically, the, these two arrows down, if you click them, you can see that all the recipes uh, sort of move. So as I press this one, you can see that these numbers are going down. So this is step five. Now it's closest to the uh, left. And if I press the other button, it basically just uh, slides all the steps this way. So if I would like to modify any of these parameters here, any of these numbers on the screen, I basically have to bring, for example, if I have to change uh, the argon gas flow in step 3, I would have to move step 3 to the far left, close, close to these buttons, and I then press this button. And you see there's another pop-up window, and you can change this number, so let's say 45. And you see that this is changed. So. I'll just pull this back. So the way generally the recipe works, uh, we have this thing called the step processing time. And this tells you how, how many seconds the machine is going to stay in this state set by these numbers here. We have the gases. We have the process pressure, which is 5 millitors for this step. We have ECR system, which is the microwave power I explained earlier. And we have the RF system. I will explain this also. This is important for uh, biasing the plasma. Uh, and you don't have to do anything. You just set a number here. And then the plasma sort of biases itself with respect to the uh, wafer. So you have more anisotropic etching. Uh, there is a backside helium uh, setting here. This is basically... Uh, for heat exchange of the wafer, as I explained, the chuck uh, has these ceramic pins and the uh, heat conduction through these pins is not very fast. So the backside helium is what actually uh, promotes the heat exchange between the chuck 
uh, or the cooler or heater, and the wafer itself. So this is what what stabilizes the temperature of the wafer. Uh, there is also additional uh, parameter called tolerance check delay. I think this is for mass production purposes, and we don't we don't generally use this. This number we can just generally set to a large number, so it's not going to affect, I think, uh, the operation of the machine. Uh, so let me show you. Let's change this recipe into a gallium arsenide and azotropic etching recipe by copying steps from the gallium arsenide uh, and azotropic etching recipe. I s when I press this button recipe, I can uh, get a different recipe. So I, I will select an iso, and then so now the recipe is an iso, and I have. You see, I have different gas flow rates and give different steps. This is a previous to save recipe. Any changes you make here is automatically saved, so you don't have to uh, save it yourself. So I will just co hit this copy step button, and then we have another pop-up. I would like to copy step one. And I'm going to, again, select this other recipe. And I will paste it into step one I will repeat this to copy all the three steps of this recipe to uh, our new recipe So generally, each recipe ends when it sees a, a step processing time of zero. So this is like the uh, stop signal for the recipe. And you have this additional step here, uh, which I'm going to delete. So. We have a warning signal, but that's not important, I think. So now we have this uh, three-step recipe, uh, and the fourth step has a step process time of zero, so it's going to stop there. The machine is going to unload the wafer after the third step. So uh, let me tell you what this recipe does. So you can see all the gas flow rates in the first step are zero, and only backside helium is non-zero, it's set to 10. And this is for 30 seconds. So this step is intended for stabilization of the wafer temperature to the chuck temperature. So when you load in the wafer, it's going to stay for 30 seconds, and it's going to stabilize. Then it's going to go into the next step, uh, and this is where we start to flow some gases. You can see we have an argon gas of uh, 15 standard cubic centimeters. Uh, per minute, I think, or per second, yeah. And uh, we have BCL3, uh, which is a flow rate of 10 SCCM, and chlorine, it, it, it only has a, a 1 SCCM flow rate, and the set flow process pressure is 2 millitors, and uh, rest is the same. So we don't have any microwave power uh, or any RF power in the second step. So there is no action plasma or there is no actuation. And this step takes about 45 seconds. And uh, the reason why there is this step is the gas flow rates have to stabilize before you can start your plasma to do a stable, well-controlled plasma etching. And uh, mass flow controllers have their feedback and they have their uh, settling time. So generally, 45 seconds for this step is uh, pretty much enough for the machine to stabilize. And after stabilization of the pressure and the gas flow rates, we go on uh, to the next step, where we have actually uh, 400 watts of microwave power and 47 watts of RF power. So 
this is where the actual etching takes place. The third step is our etching step. And this takes 120 seconds, which is two minutes, and we can change, num change this number. Uh, we can make it 300 seconds, which is five minutes. And basically, after this step, because, as I said before, it sees a step cost in time of zero, it's going to end the recipe and uh, purge the chamber and take the wafer out. So let's go back to the run mode. <laughs> so uh, we have a schematic of the machine, the microwave generator, the tuning stops, the chamber, the uh, basically gases that are supplied from upstream or uh, from downstream, the backside helium, and uh, basically we have the valve position uh, for, the temp uh, for the pressure of the chamber. We have all these readings, so the pressure of the chamber, the temperature of the chuck, and uh, basically the RF generator settings, microwave generator, forward and reflective powers, and the bias voltage generated due to the RF uh, power during etching. Uh, and uh, we also have the recipe status window here, which tells about the step, actual step time. Uh, and uh, you can see how much time has elapsed during the run of the process through here. So to be able to run a recipe, to, do, to be able to do etching, we have to turn on the three boxes down here. So. These boxes these three boxes control the RF and microwave powers. And uh, basically we turn on this button. This is a RF automatic tuning network. Uh, this one is supply the RF power supply. And this one is the microwave generator power supply and control system. So it'll take about uh, 10 to 20 seconds to turn on. And when it turns on, you can see that the local light comes on. So this light here, the local light, shows that the machine is basically being controlled uh, <coughs> only from the dials here. Uh, because we want to control the machine uh, through our recipe, uh, through the computer remotely, we have to press this button. Uh, for a second and then pull. So the local light comes off and the system goes into, this This box goes into the limit operation mode. So now this uh, box or the microwave power can be controlled through our computer control system here. So these are the three boxes that we have to turn on and uh, set the proper uh, operating condition. So now we are ready to uh, maybe do a etching for uh, the position. What I generally recommend to uh, users is uh, because you have to condition maybe the chamber for a while before if you want to do a very well controlled etching step you want to hit a certain depth etching depth uh, the stability of the plasma is important so if the machine has been used by somebody else before you and he has done, run a different recipe he or she has run a different recipe and the machine the chamber conditioning is uh, different, or the tuning stops are set to that uh, specific plasma condition, then if you put your pressure samples in the beginning, in the first run, and if you want to uh, etch a certain controlled amount of time, you may not be able to get there, because the plasma may not start. The plasma may start, but may fluctuate. You may have too much back reflective power, so uh, the etching is not well controlled or uh, you don't get the edge, depth, edge rate that uh, you intend to get. So basically, <coughs> generally what I recommend is in the first, uh, the first thing you should do is set the step processing time to five minutes for your own recipe and then put in a blank dummy carrier wafer. 
and uh, for five minutes run uh, your recipe with a blank wafer. And in this five minutes or like a few minutes of time, you will have time to see if you have too much of bake effective power. You will have time to tune uh, your tuning stops to optimize your plasma. And uh, when you put in your uh, own wafer, small piece of Gallimard side wafer, uh, the plasma will have less of a problem to start and uh, you will basically have uh, less problems uh, uh, by getting the depth that you want in, in, in the first one. So, you can take a break. So, uh, Basically now I'm going to show you how to load the wafer and run the recipe. Uh, in the idle state, the load lock is pumped down. And we have basically these uh, two uh, pressure uh, displays, uh, which shows uh, the process chamber and the load lock pressure. So, uh, when, I, uh, when it's in the idle state, uh, there is no wafer inside, uh, but the machine may not know this. So when I hit start here, using the uh, light pen, if I click on start, it's going to basically pop up this wait window, and it'll uh, say here, waiting for load lock transfer pressure. And you can see that this pressure gauge here falls down to about 100. I think uh, why they have uh, introduced this uh, step is they want to pump down uh, the load lock before uh, raising this valve. So initially the machine doesn't know, is not sure that if there's a wafer inside or not. So it thinks I think there's a wafer inside, although there is no wafer. So it's now going in as you can see here, to unload a non-existent wafer. So, this is generally uh, what happens in the first run when you turn on the machine, because the way we shut down the machine is uh, in the final step we do a system reset uh, to reset everything. So now the machine is trying to unload this uh, non-existent paper. So, once this is done, again, the load lock is being pumped down because there may be some residual gas, gases like toxic gases that may have flown into the load lock uh, when the valve was open. Uh, so it's just pumping this down all the way before venting it to air. And now it's venting. So you can also see here, we have an O-ring that seals the load lock. So as this vents, you can see that uh, pressure on the O-ring is getting uh, less and less. And uh, basically this black line, the black line sort of narrows down. So it's going to take a minute. And when you hear the click, you 
see on the screen also a prompt it says place vapor on loader then press ok to continue so at this point we can open the load lock and this is basically also another important step uh, of operation of the machine uh, it's not too crucial but uh, somewhat important so the way you place a dummy or uh, a carrier wafer in the machine is you have to make sure that the flat here is aligned with the flat uh, on the load arm so you place your wafer and you can sort of uh, correct the angle and tap it a little bit so it sits in its place nicely and this is somewhat important because uh, uh, because of the mechanical design of the machine uh, if the wafer is misaligned it may fall off the load arm while loading or it may uh, not sit on the chuck correctly and uh, the wafer may crack you may lose your own small gallium arsenide uh, samples they may fall into the machine the machine then becomes inoperable for at least a few days because somebody has to open up the machine and uh, clean the small broken piece of paper so this has happened a few times at least so you have to be careful that uh, you are putting in the wafer nicely and it sits nicely on the loader so once we do this uh, we can close the load arm, uh, the load lock, uh, and now we are ready to uh, start loading. So at this point, uh, we are going to hit OK, and the machine is going to start uh, pumping down the load lock and load the wafer into the uh, main chamber. Okay, so as we press the button, uh, the chamber starts to pump down, the, uh, the load lock again pumps down, and uh, once it reaches uh, a set point pressure, uh, low enough so that the uh, interchange uh, valve can open, it's going to start loading uh, the wafer into the chuck. And in this scene, I think uh, you should be able to see how uh, the pins hold the wafer and how the chuck clamps down on it uh, it'll take a few seconds in this stage uh, because of some mechanical problems with the machines once in a while we have some shaking or some misorientation and uh, the wafer uh, may not uh, may not sit right on the pins and it may sometimes break the pins or it may itself crack down so to avoid this problem generally while doing this loading uh, we look uh, through the windows on the left of the machine and maybe uh, put a torch uh, into one of the windows and uh, look through the other window and uh, if there is anything wrong apparently uh, in the loading then we just hit escape on the keyboard now now I think you see that the uh, valve is open and the wafer is being loaded onto the chuck This, this funny sound also shows that the machine is getting older, I think. It's like a scratch sound. So the load arm is going to come off and uh, the wafer is going to be clamped down on the...
Now maybe we can. I think the recipe is now served. We can uh, look look at the window. So on the screen, we can see uh, the gas flow rates are increasing slowly uh, to the point which is set by the recipe. If you remember, we had 15 ccm of argon, so it shoots up slowly to 15.2 and stabilizes around it. We had 10 BCL3 and it's about 10.5. We had 1.0 chlorine and it's very slow. It, it rises very slowly and still at 0.4. So we have the actual step processing time here, as you can see, and we have 10 more seconds for the uh, gases to stabilize. And we, uh, the pressure is also stable at two, that's our set point. And now the plasma is going to be started by, you can see, we can see that uh, the plasma is on. Basically, we have this light light. And we, we see on the raw forward and reflected dials uh, that we are putting in for. So basically we have 400 forward and 67 reflected. We want to get the reflected power below maybe 10 or so. So we turn these dials and we see the reflected power change. Generally, how, how I do it is I just tune one of them and find the minimum. Go to the next one, see if I get a lower number and go to the next one. So and you can see that we can decrease the reflective power to a minimum. So generally uh, we, uh, we can note these tuning stop values and uh, use them in a further process. And you can see that as the reflective power is less, the color of the plasma has changed from a violet to a brighter yellow color, which means we are now having a more efficient plasma. And so uh, we can check our step processing time here on the screen. We also we still have a few like two more minutes, two and a half more minutes to go. In the meantime, we can note all these numbers into our logbook. And this is a good time to write all these numbers into the logbook. So we put in the date, our username, and So we basically note the numbers on the screen, the actual flow rates into the readings. We note uh, the forward and reflected powers. And also note the tuning stops.
so so we have to fill in these numbers so if there is any problems for example this uh, high backside helium flow indicates but there may be a leak with the o-ring so this this may be fixed uh, if people go through this uh, logbook they may find out they may diagnose the machine better so now the process uh, process is finished and it's waiting uh, for unloading the vapor out of the machine generally it purges after the run with, uh, with argon gas and then uh, that's for a minute and uh, pumps down on the loader to remove any leaked uh, gases And now it's going to uh, unload the wafer. Generally, in this step, as a loading step, uh, some, we used to recommend the users to look through the window uh, to make sure that the wafer is uh, properly picked up by the loader uh, and doesn't fall or like, it's not broken or anything. So, uh, in any step, if you have a problem uh, like the misaligned wafer, then if you hit escape, the machine is going to hold uh, whatever it's doing, turn off the microwave power, turn off the gases, and it's going to wait. And in the meantime, you can just contact a technician to uh, solve your problem. Uh, maybe if your wafer is stuck inside, then uh, they may just come in, open up the machine, and clean your wafer for you. So if anything goes wrong, you just hit escape. And now we are unloading the wafer. So I think we were lucky and uh, we had no problem uh, with loading and unloading the wafer. And now the valve will close and uh, it's going to vent the chamber to atmosphere so we can unload the wafer.
So once we hear the click, we can open up and remove our vapor. And this completes one run. If you would like to do further runs, uh, we just put up put in the new wafer, new carrier wafer, with, or uh, we just mount our new uh, small pieces on the carrier wafer, and we repeat the same procedure, but by just hitting start. In the meantime, if you want to change some process parameter, uh, then you just, without doing anything, you edit your recipe, you modify your recipe, come back to this window, and when you hit start, you can uh, again. Uh, load in your new wafer and do your new process. So once you are uh, done for the day, I recommend uh, the users to hit the system reset. So this this basically pumps down on the load load lock. Okay, so uh, basically this pumps down the load, up, load, uh, load, load lock and uh, after this uh, basically we are just going to close this window and set the system into idle mode, in purge mode and then put on the screen saver and shut this uh, electronic stem. So once the weight light is off uh, and the load, load lock is pumped down, we hit close and we uh, go back to uh, the main window. Then we go, we hit idle mode and we say go idle. And we can see that uh, there's a 50 SCCM argon gas setting and it's basically stabilizing and it's pumping down on the chamber. So the process, process uh, the chamber uh, pressure is about 2 millitors. So this basically this is the idle state of the machine. And you want to protect the screen by hitting sleep. So it takes a few seconds or a minute to for the machine to respond to the sleep command. screensaver comes on, we can pull the monitor, uh, the, the keyboard back into its place and uh, we can basically shut down these three boxes that we turned on in the beginning, shut this down, shut the RF and uh, shut the RF tuning box and uh, basically that's all for the basic operation of the machine. Uh, at this point generally I ask if anybody has any questions but I guess uh, if you have any questions you can contact uh, the technicians, land boot or maybe uh, uh, research staff and you might really for uh, further questions with the operation of the machine, what materials are allowed, what processes are allowed and uh, if you keep your uh, findings in the logbook then other people can also make uh, use of your findings, your calibrations. Uh, good luck!